Good morning. Good afternoon, folks. <laughs> Get started. Uh, my name is Brian Amiro. Um, I'll be chairing today's seminar series. Welcome to our first seminar um, from the Faculty of Agriculture and Food Sciences, jointly with the Department of Plant Science, and the Advanced Plant Science Seminars. Um, first of all, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Delanda Fernando, who will be introducing our speaker today. Uh, Dr. Fernando is the Dean of Studies at St. Paul's College at the University here, and also a professor and plant pathologist here in the Plant Science Department. Um, he's the current immediate past president of the Canadian Pathological Society, a world authority on host pathogen interactions, mostly working on canola and wheat in Canada. He just received a fellowship of the American Phytopathological Society, Say that word. Um, and um, also received a very high award for his research for sustainable agriculture on plant growth promoting rival bacteria. Um, he published over 138 papers and 14 book chapters and supervised over 75 graduate students. So, Dr. Fernando, could you please come and introduce our speaker? Good afternoon, everyone. <coughs> It's uh, really nice to see such a big uh, turnout at the first seminar of the Faculty of um, Agricultural and Food Sciences, as well as, as uh, Dr. Brian Amiro mentioned, the uh, joint thing with the Department of Plant Science. So it's, uh, uh, I think it's a first uh, a joint uh, uh, seminar, and I hope uh, this will be a wonderful experience for all of you who have turned out. Uh, before I introduce Dr. Steve Markrock from Australia, I think I should thank the Dean's Office uh, for arranging this uh, seminar. Uh, there's lots that goes into uh, arranging the seminar. Uh, refreshments, uh, coffee, and uh, thanks to Heather. Uh, I don't know whether Heather is here. Heather did a wonderful job uh, making the right communications uh, with me and Dr. Markrock and uh, got everything uh, ready. Um, Thank you to the Department of Plant Science uh, and the uh, seminar committee for putting this uh, series together. Uh, we have a wonderful committee. I don't know whether we are having everyone here. Uh, uh, Callum Morrison, is Callum here? Okay, Callum is the new student uh, rep from, in the, uh, from the graduate students rep on the committee, uh, Yvonne Lolly. Yvonne is not here. Uh, Claudius Tesola is not here. <laughs> okay. uh, Dr. Kenny Lee is here. And uh, I'm the chair of the uh, Department of Plants and Seminar Committee. So it's a great honor to have all of you here. And again, a real um, thank you to the graduate students, not only for, for participating in this uh, series, but also the, uh, recommending speakers. Uh, I have seen the list. They are all eminent speakers that you have selected. I don't know whether I, when I was a graduate student, I could have done that. Uh, maybe the present uh, social media and the internet helps you to do that better than what I could have done. So thank you again for selecting people, and we'll be bringing some of them as uh, uh, speakers to this uh, seminar series. So now I have the great pleasure in introducing Dr. Steve Marcroft from Marcroft Grains Pathology. Uh, he is a Black Lake Canola researcher, and I've known him for now almost 10 years and uh, we have collaborated, worked together, um, and uh, he brings a very interesting perspective. There comes Dr. Lolly uh, <laughs> and Callum. Okay, so I've already introduced them. Uh, so they all clapped for you when you were not here. <laughs> so Dr. Mark Croft uh, uh, has a different uh, opportunity where we, so for example, Black Lake, even though it's the same pathogen, the way it causes disease in the two countries is a little different. So I hope uh, Dr. Markrop can uh, touch on that because now he has seen some of that in our own fields when he visited the common resuscitation yesterday with us. So to introduce Dr. Markrop, he began working in Canola in 1994 with SADI. Uh, SADI stands for? Uh, the South Australian Research Institute. Yeah, okay. 
uh, low rainfall agronomy, and from 1998 to 2004, uh, he was with Agriculture Victoria as a plant pathologist working on the canola with the canola breeding program. In 2004, uh, Dr. Marcroft uh, received his PhD uh, from the University of Melbourne. Uh, some of the black leg researchers might uh, recognize the name Dr. Barbara Howler. Uh, so Doug, he did his PhD with Dr. Barbara Howler, a very eminent um, pathologist. And uh, then uh, started his own business in black leg research. That's uh, another very big step forward to have a research uh, company, and that's what he, that's the Marcroft's Grains Pathology, which has expanded to include a team of seven people, and I've met some of them, and they are excellent scientists, not particularly in one particular area, they, they might be biotechnologists, so it feeds into a very uh, cohesive, Team, uh, approach that Dr. Markov takes um, to manage diseases. These responsibilities are for the national black leg rating, uh, <coughs> resistance groups, genetics and resistance, identifying quantitative resistance, monitoring the evolution of the black leg fungus, fungicide efficacy and timing, and that's part of the reason he's here uh, on a, uh, a Syngenta launch with a new product. And um, so we had done uh, work in Canada. He had done work in Australia, so he's here. And again, I thank the Syngenta um, uh, Canada for um, bringing him here and us having that opportunity to bring and invite him to give a talk here. So he has also developed a black leg uh, app. And I hope uh, Dr. Markov will address that in, our, in the presentation because there are people, not necessarily plant pathologists, but who might be interested in uh, uh, development of an app. So we, I hope uh, he will present that. On a side note, uh, so I have visited uh, him in Horsham, Australia. I spent my sabbatical uh, with uh, his group, and it was a wonderful opportunity to learn about black leg and come to know Steve better. Steve is married, has two children, 17-year-old son and 16-year-old daughter, and uh, he owns, I think, 12 boats, <laughs> and, and uh, he's a big uh, surfer, uh, swimmer, and uh, a fisherman, right? Thank you, guys, for fishing. <laughs> Okay, thanks for that. Firstly, I'd just like to start acknowledging everything I'm going to talk today is a real team effort. Like I said there's seven of us here together. Um, really, I look after the um, sort of the industry side and the, or the field work, and Angela Vanderwell looks after the genetics in the project. And she's actually employed by the University of Melbourne, but she's in the same site that I am in Horsham. Um, so one of the things I just wanted to mention was we actually get our funding from the GRDC, the Grains Research and Development Corporation. So in Australia, every farmer has to pay a research levy on every tonne of grain they produce, and that's compulsory. So it's a 1% levy they pay. And this money then goes into a large bucket of money, and then people like myself can actually then apply for that funding. So everything that we do, although we try to do good science, it has to be very industry-based with results back to the industry, because it's funded by the industry. So it's not quite like government funding. Oh, I'm not sure what's happened there. OK, that's, uh, <laughs> that was a map of Australia when I last looked. <laughs> it's now two maps in Western Australia. It should be over there as what? <laughs> that's bizarre. Anyway, um, it wasn't like that yesterday. So anyway, here's Australia. <laughs> here's the canola growing regions in Eastern Australia. Um, and there's the canola growing region in Western Australia. I'll talk a little bit about the Air Peninsula, which is um, there in South Australia. The dark areas are where we grow more canola, and it's these areas where we really have the major black leg issues. Um, you can't really see from that, but um, canola is very much grown in the south of the country. All the middle of the country is desert, and then the top of the country is more tropical. I hope we don't, that doesn't happen to any other slides. So, First, I'll just give a bit of a, uh, bit of a picture of what canola production looks like in Australia. We have a very, very variable climate, as you probably know. We have lots of droughts, and then we have lots of very good years as well. But not only that, we have a lot of variation 
within Australia. So at the moment, this is a droughted canola crop where we'll get no yield whatsoever from it. And this is what a lot of New South Wales looks like this year. Um, and we have, also have years where we can have fantastic production. And this is, where, this is what the crops look like where I'm from in more south, southern Australia at the moment. So massive variability between years, massive variability between growing regions. We also do some funny things with our canola. So we, um, in Australia, most farms are mixed farms, meaning they have um, either sheep or cattle as well. So we have a very animal-based system, and therefore we look at our crops as a source of protein for animals as well. So in this photo here, the farmer's cutting down his canola crop to produce silage. Um, we'll also make canola hay, and we can make some excellent canola quality hay. And it really actually, in a variable climate, having this animal system in there gives you so many more options to control, to actually manage the disease and make money. In this crop here, they're actually grazing the canola. So this is becoming more and common in Australia, where we grow our crops quite early. We get lots of vegetative production before it gets too cold in the winter. That's the other thing I should have said. We're one of the few countries that grow our crops over the winter. And we get most of our actual production in the spring, but we have to grow the crops in the winter because um, otherwise the spring isn't long enough to actually grow the crop. So we have a long season. Our, um, cr our, our growing season is typically six months, about twice as long as it is in Canada. So in this case here, they put the sheep in, they, grows, they graze the sheep, and then before um, the spring, they remove the sheep and let it go through to grain and get it, so they get uh, money from wheat and wool and then grain production as well. And these are becoming very profitable because the actual price of um, wool and lamb has really spiked in the last few years. So talking to this farmer here, he said by the time he removes his sheep, he's already paid for all the inputs for his crop and then his grain is complete profit after that. And it just gives you a lot of that... Um, and takes a lot of the risk out of the crop. A lot of hay is made when we um, have things like we have frost events and we lose a lot of the grain. Farmers can then quick, very quickly, and they've got really good tools for making decisions to quickly cut down the whole crop and turn it into hay. And our crops tend to grow, because we've got a longer growing season, our crops tend to grow a lot taller than yours. We have a lot more biomass. And in many, re many situations, especially if it's coming into a drought, the price of um, hay is very, very high and farmers can make more money out of hay than they ever can actually out of grain. So it's just a whole mixture. Obviously, in most seasons, we prefer to go through to grain, but it just gives us more options, I guess, which is important in a um, really variable climate. So now getting back to why we're here about black leg. So, and I'm just going to run through the history of black leg in Australia. It's been a bit of a fascinating story. Um, so black leg first, black leg, no, canola, sorry, first came to Australia from Canada. It was introduced from Canada because at the time Australia was producing too much wheat and the government actually put restrictions on how much wheat each farmer could produce. So they really wanted an alternative crop and one, they tried a whole range of crops and one of them happened to be canola. And fortunately enough, in the first couple of years of growing canola, everyone saw that this was actually going to be a really good viable crop. They saw the potential in the crop. Unfortunately, in the early 1970s, in about 1973, black leg came in and it completely destroyed it. Pretty much every plant died, every paddock was destroyed with black leg. But I guess the important thing was it had been grown just about long enough for the government to see the potential that this could be a really big crop for Australia and therefore um, government money was put in. There was three breeding programs started in Australia and with the aim of, um, of breeding um, canola. So uh, many of you might know Greg Buzzer at the time. He was one of the, the Victorian breeder from where I'm from and he said, oh, this should be a really easy fix. Um, it took them 15 years of breeding to get good resistance into the cultivars. Um, and at that time, they'd also obviously improved the, um, the crop types to be suited to our environment and the quality of the canola cultivars. So it was really not until then, to the late 1980s, that we got what we already called the cultivars that we're um, growing today. And then we saw production increasing in the 1990s. And then by the late 1990s, when the farmers had a bit of a play with it and got some confidence, we already started to see the area of canola really increase. So back then, we were breeding with what we now know is a couple of different major genes, RM3 and RM4, which are present in Canada, and we had some quantitative resistance. Um, we, at the time, no one knew what the, these um, major genes existed, but they were in the cultivars. We've gone back since and had a look. Farmers were using a four-year rotation. There'd been some epidemiology work that showed that black lead came from canola stubble. Wait four years for all the stubble to decompose, and you reduce the disease pressure. And we also did, even back then, have a, um, a fungicide, one which we applied to the fertiliser, called blue trifold, but it really wasn't used because it was too expensive at the time. So it was with that that the canola industry started to grow. 
However, as the canola industry grew and became more popular, the disease severity started to increase and it started to come back and really bite growers. So that we know by the early 2000s, there were a number of things happening. There was more canola stubble, more disease pressure, more disease. But not only that, we didn't know it at the time, but our resistance genes were being overcome by the pathogen as well. So the, that 15 years of breeding for the resistance was actually being overcome by the pathogen and our cultivars were becoming more susceptible again. And it really struck us in the year 2000, um, Advantage Seeds released a new major gene, Sylvesterous resistance, or now known as lep 3 and it was a major gene, it was a gene for gene interaction, and it meant that those new cultivars were immune to the disease. And it was very interesting at the time, those cultivars, in my opinion, weren't very good cultivars. They were actually direct crosses from Canadian cultivars into Australia, but containing this major gene. And yet, even though they weren't adapted, we saw yield increases in the field of around 30%. Obviously, when you get a 30% yield increase from a cultivar, every single farmer is then going to use that cultivar. And that's what we saw. So in that little area I pointed out before, we had um, on the lower air peninsula where the black league was, we saw um, we, they completely adopted the sylvestrous technology. They had no disease at all for three years. And then in 2004, every single crop died again as that major gene was overcome. And that was the issue that you know, we had to um, contend with at the time. So I guess unlike Canada, in Australia, we've had these massive black league wipeouts of whole regions. And that's really what's driven, I guess, a lot of the management and the adoption of the technologies we use now. And I guess, you know, from a pathology perspective, if you're trying to adopt a new technology, having an industry get hurt a couple of times really helps the adoption of new technologies. Um, it's something obviously we want to avoid, but it um, certainly helps um, funding. And Delantha mentioned I started my business in 2004. I started on a really, um, on a real spike in funding that became available for black league research. So really, then the rest of the talk is about how do we grow canola sustainably to stop these things happening. And so if we get black league uh, management wrong without a resistance breakdown, this is the type of disease we see with lots of dead and dying plants, cankers, and internal infection, which reduces yield. But at the same time, if we do everything right, even with all the disease pressure that we've got, there's no reason we can't grow crops that are like that as well. And I guess that's what all our management is aimed at doing. So firstly, quickly just running through the life cycle of um, black leg in Australia. So black leg survives on canola stubble, as you know. Sexual reproduction occurs on that stubble and it produces these windblown spores. They're all sexual spores, so genetic potential of the disease is extremely high. In Australia, we don't freeze our stubble every year, we just leave it out in the summer and therefore we get lots of sexual recombination. That's a really key difference between here and Canada. And it's interesting, last year when I was here in Canada in February, just looking at your stubble under the snow, I could not believe how clean it was. It was just amazing to see a golden you know, stubble clean, as is all black and looks like this over the summer. It's, it undergoes massive sexual reproduction. These, as I said, these are, because they're a result of sexual reproduction, they're all genetically different to each other. These windblown spores then land on our cotyledons and the pathogen becomes a necrotroph. It um, causes a leaf lesion and then it grows down the petiole into the stem and causes the crown canker and we can also get root infection. One of the other key things with this disease is that when it lands on the plant and causes these lesions, it produces pycnidia spores which are asexual. And that's another key thing for passing on virulence. So if you're producing a million spores and one of them happens to be virulent, that what virulent one gets the whole crop to itself and then can clone itself within the plant so it can increase its genetic potential really quickly. And which is why we see in Australia, we've seen it with major genes occurring all the time, that if it's a successful cultivar and grown over a wide area, we get about three years use out of that major gene before we get that sylvestrous type effect where the crops fall over again. So just to give you an idea of what the stubble looks like, obviously in the middle of summer, so it looks a bit different than you know, the, your crops in the middle of winter, lots of stubble and uh, not frozen. Our stubble, so when we come back to sow our crops the next year, is completely covered in spores, or fruiting bodies, sorry. This is a picture of a microscope um, slide. So in this, we put four pieces of stubble into a little wind tubble, tunnel and collected the spores. <laughs> and that's the, you can actually see them without a microscope, they pile up so high. So we're talking trillions and trillions of spores production. So, I'm going to get into the talk. One of the key things of controlling crown canker in um, black leg is to protect the seedling. So it's this infection here we see on the cotyledons. The, 
once it's infected with cotyledons, it grows down within the vascular tissue down to the crown of the plant and causes necrosis. And on a very small plant like this, it's only got to grow about a centimetre to get there and it causes the, the necrosis. So it's this disease we see here at the end of the year is actually a result of our seedling infection. So we know in Australia, once you get past about the third leaf growth stage, you don't get any more crown cankers. And once you get past about the fifth leaf stage, you don't get any more internal infection. So all our management has been about protecting that seedling. Leaf lesions later on in the year, basically the disease, the plants escape the disease. By the time they've actually caused the lesion, grown down a 20 centimetre leaf down to the crown, which is now quite strong and woody, it just takes too long for the canker to form. So it's all about protecting a seedling. So that's where black leg was up until recently. We've now all of a sudden been hit with another type of black leg. We call it another type, but it's not. It's exactly the same pathogen. But all of a sudden, we suddenly started seeing flower infection, branch infection, head infection, which has become a real um, yield limiter to us as well. Um, so, and I'll go through some of the reasons why a little bit later, but generally we see these flowers are infected. It grows along the peduncle of the flower, hits the branch, and then actually grows into the branch. And again, it grows up in the vascular tissue. And then it can take the top of the plant off, or in most cases, just gets to this stage. But because the moisture and nutrient flow within the plant has been reduced, we'll see smaller pods, lower numbers of seeds or whatever. And we're actually getting some very significant yield losses from black leg at this particular time. So there's just a photo there from our flower infection. When we first did, we only started working on this type of the disease in 2016. Um, it was only when we actually got some money, it was, we realised it had actually become a problem by then. And you can see here, here's a plant here which doesn't have any physical cankers or anything in it, and yet the whole top of the plant has just died off, and when you crack it open, it's just full of black leg. So we're seeing a lot of that in commercial paddocks now. So wondering why black leg has suddenly changed what it's doing, the first thing we did was we looked to see if it was the other species called Biglobosa, and it wasn't. Um, and then we looked to see um, whether the isolates were actually evolved to actually affect this later type of the plant, and we showed that they hadn't. It was exactly the same isolates. So we started doing some experiments, and what we realised very quickly was it was pretty much due to the time of flowering. So here is, um, we, this is a survey we did of agronomists. We did about 130 agronomists last year, and we asked them when they sow their crop 20 years ago compared to when they sow their crop today and how it all works. And you can see 20 years ago, so I'll go back a step. So our winter, uh, the way our season works is it's very hot and dry over our summer, which is sort of November, December, January, February. And then we normally get an opportunity to plant our crops in mid-April to late May. And then we have a cold, wet winter, and then our spring. And we know from leaf lesion severity during the year, et cetera, that our main infection period is this winter period, where it's cold and wet, and we get lots of showers, and we get leaf moisture, et cetera. So what we found was, when we compared what, had hap what was happening now and what would happen 20 years ago, was that when people were sowing here, they were sowing into May, which was quite cold for us. The plants are staying at a small seedling for a long time, which is another reason we get a lot of disease and you don't. So really over our winter period, our plants are staying as seedlings and getting bombarded with spores every day. And then we were flowering in our spring. What's happened with whole range, for a whole range of reasons, new technologies, new herbicide types, new sowing systems, and a more a high propensity for dry and hot springs for us, the sowing window has actually moved further forward. And what's happened is that the flowering period has correspondingly moved forward into our period. So what we're seeing is that instead of our crops in this period being vegetative, leading to leaf lesions and crown canker, all of a sudden our crops are going reproductive in that, that period and we're getting direct infection up onto the flowers, stems, branches. So that was one reason we think. There's another reason we think, as I said, changing technology and changing farming systems has changed the way the disease is reacting. So this is just a photo, and I'm sure this could be in Canada, with inter-row sowing, satellite guide tractors, zero tillage, etc., which has had a massive adoption in Australia. But one of the consequences is of stubble. If you're dealing with a stubble-borne pest and you're conserving stubble, obviously it's going to change the way the disease works. This photo here is a photo of a barley crop, and you can see here there's um, the canola stubble from the previous year, still completely intact and sitting there, and there's our um, susceptible canola crop you know, right next door. And what you will look at, if you see here, here's our vertical piece of stubble, and it's got no pseudothesia on it. Here's a piece of stubble that's lying down on the soil surface, 
and it's completely, I hope you can see that there with that photo, but it's completely loaded with pseudopecia, the fruiting bodies. And when I put them right next door, you can see the difference. So what we think is happening is the stubble stays standing. Obviously, it gets the rain on it, but after each rainfall event, it dries out, and that sexual reproduction isn't occurring. If the stubble is lying on the ground, staying wet on the soil, then the sexual reproduction occurs. And what we found, so we, cut, we collected stubble and counted spores being released from that stubble, and what we see here is in the first year after canola now, the horizontal stubble is releasing about 75% of the spores, whereas the vertical stubble is only releasing 25%. And when we measured it month on month, what we actually saw was this vertical stubble is actually not only releasing fewer spores, but it's actually delaying spore release as well. So instead of the spores being released from May, June, July, these spores are now being released more into our spring. And though we haven't done the causal work yet, we're suspicious that the actual farming system has changed the timing of spore release and therefore delayed that and we're getting more infection on our flowers and branches, et cetera. So it's a really interesting perspective. The other thing we've done, we actually, this year we followed this um, scoring system into the second year and we're seeing this vertical stubble here is maintaining its ability to release spores, but it's just delayed it to the second year. So it's releasing a few spores late in the growing season in year one, and then it's still got all the ability to release spores in year two. So if you're growing a canola wheat canola rotation, with full stubble control, you're actually pushing your spore production back into the canola year the year after. So we've increased our disease pressure again. So I think it's a really interesting story how the farming systems have changed, and without realising, we've actually changed the way the pathogen is actually um, you know, adapting to the growing system. It's, I guess it's one of the amazing things about evolution, how you know, nature will always find a way to, um, to solve these problems. So that's, I guess, the issue that we've got with Black League in Australia. Now I'll talk a bit about how we do control it. So we always tend to accept some yield loss, but really with our management plans, we want to stop these wipeouts. So we have four things. We have resistance breeding, which you're all very familiar with. We have resistance management. Um, we, have, uh, we still put some emphasis on cultural practices, although this is a really interesting one because most of the cultural practices are about reducing the canola production in that field, and as canola becomes very profitable, this is the one that gets cut out by the industry. Um, and in more recent times, we have a much, much greater reliance on fungicide. So genetic resistance breeding, we have, we have major genes and we have quantitative resistance. So when you have no resistance, you get your cotyledons and leaves infected, it grows down the PDO and you get canker. If you have a major gene, we have a gene-for-gene -gene interaction. The plant recognises the protein in the pathogen, turns on its defence and you get no disease. Or this is what most of the cultivars in Australia look like, where that major gene has been overcome, but we've got quantitative resistance. I actually asked the breeder what was a good definition for quantitative resistance. Basically, he said, it means we've got no understanding whatsoever. We just like to give it a fancy term, and then everyone is very comfortable with that. So that's where we're at at the moment with our quantitative resistance. So what do we see in the field? When our major resistance genes are effective, the plants are completely immune, and that goes through the entire life, um, life span of the plant. No disease on the seedlings, no crown cankers, no flower infection, no upper canopy, no stems, no branches, no pod infection. The plant is completely immune for its whole life. When that resistance gets overcome, it becomes susceptible at all those growth stages. And as I said, we tend to get about three years use out of a new major gene or a new major gene combination. So a lot of the seed companies now will recombine major genes and recreate resistance. So if gene one's been overcome and gene two's been overcome, they can put them back together in the same plant and then the pathogen hasn't seen that combination before and it becomes resistant again. So, as I said before, we're going through what happened with our, this first one, with the major gene broke down, so it was resistant for three years, became susceptible. One of the things here is, with this major gene resistance, it doesn't matter what the disease pressure is, it's immune under all circumstances. We can grow canola on canola in high rainfall zones, and these major genes are still completely effective. Whereas with our quantitative resistance, as I said, we don't understand anything about the resistance, but we do have a lot of information about the phenotypes we see as a result of it. So here's um, our disease ratings here, and this will be typically what we see with those different disease ratings, basing on the different quantitative resistance. And the theory is that basically this one might have more resistance genes than that one, and that one they will have some sort of additive effect. 
The thing with, made, with quantitative resistance, though, is it's only been selected for and it's effective at the crown of the plant. So we can have plants which have got excellent quantitative resistance, don't get crown cankers, but they are completely susceptible to the flower stems, branches and pods. And that's been a real issue for our industry. So with quantitative resistance too, we don't see that it's stable. So plants with different quantitative resistance will react quite differently under different disease pressures. So you can take a moderately resistant cultivar, under moderate disease pressure it's extremely effective, but when you put it up against really high disease pressure for us, which would be wheat canola wheat, next to canola stubble from the previous year, then you start to see disease. And this is actually really key management to how we use our fungicides. So a farmer in a high rainfall zone here will use a fungicide on that one, maybe not on that one. In a lower rainfall, they would use it on that one, etc. So it's really understanding what your disease pressure is, what your black leg rating is when you're making your fungicide decisions. We also have erosion of quantitative resistance. There's been a lot of theory that quantitative resistance is effective against all isots equally and is extremely stable. Unfortunately, that's not the case for us. We see our quantitative resistance being eroded. So it doesn't completely collapse like the major genes do, but it does get eroded over time. So we've got some examples here. These are different canola cultivars. This is the resistance group. So these three all contain RLM1, and this one contains RLM3. And this is the year it was released as a cultivar. So you can see here this particular cultivar, group A cultivar, and then these are all released by the same seed company and you can see it's black leg rating. So it's an MR, 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 and then in the fifth year, the black leg starts to overcome that quantitative resistance as well. And it's slipped a level to an MR, MS, and then year after, it's slipped again to an MS. This cultivar here was released a couple of years later, but it's actually followed the identical pattern. So we don't know anything about the genetics, but we might assume that they've got the same quantitative resistance. This cultivar here, in 2015, when it was released, they all looked identical, but this one has now followed a different pattern again. So that's the type of knowledge, I guess, we can generate about our quantitative resistance. And this color of our hair has been around forever and has never slipped at all. So just an example of what a farmer would see. These two cultivars looked identical. Um, they had the same quantitative resistance. A couple of years later, you know, one's completely slipped and one still stayed up. So it's very important that the farmers therefore understand what is the major gene in my cultivar, but also understand what is the quantitative resistance in my cultivar as well. So how do we do that? Every year in Australia we grow black leg nurseries, the same as you do in Canada. Um, we don't go to the effort of cutting all our plants open. We just um, let them die and then count how many survive. It's a much easier system for us. So there's a resistant cultivar and there's one that's obviously not quite so, so um, resistant. The thing with this data is we don't know whether it's a major gene that's achieving that or the quantitative resistance and the farmer to some degree doesn't care. They just want to know if it's going to look like that at the end of the year or it's going to look like this at the end of the year. So how that, that's our, I guess our resistance breeding. How do we manage our resistance? As I said here, how do we stop this occurring? The interesting thing was this was all based from observations in the field on the Air Peninsula. So we had field trials over there with different cultivars and different resistance genes, even though we didn't know what they were at the time. But what we saw here, as I mentioned, our RLM3 and RLM4 cultivars prior to Sylvestris were getting a lot of disease. So this is what they looked like in the early 2000s. And then the Sylvestris resistance was introduced, so which is why all the farmers started growing this and avoided this. The interesting thing was on the Air Peninsula, when that broke down in 2003, it completely collapsed, every crop died. But what we saw in the actual variety trials was that these cultivars here, which were getting a lot of disease, suddenly looked a lot more resistant. When we followed these trials through for a couple of years, the, everyone, the farmers then started growing these again, and all of a sudden the disease turned up again. And these cultivars, which were completely dropped, after a couple of years started coming alive again. So what we saw happening in the field without actually doing any science at all was that the, the cultivars we were growing were skewing black leg populations towards those cultivars which would kill them. So rather than growing, going from this to this to this, we said, well, why don't we have an industry that does that, that, and that? And that was, I guess, the whole idea of working out what the resistance genes are in our cultivars and how we could ro rotate them and give that knowledge to industry. So the first thing we looked at was um, for a whole range of cultivars was area under production and we straight away saw that the actual disease in our um, cultivars matched the area of production for those cultivars. We then did a little bit of work where we looked at um, trying to emulate what we'd seen in the field in the glasshouse. 
And you can see here we've got an RLM1 cultivar, which we've inoculated with RLM1 stubble, and we've killed the cultivar. In exactly the same screen, we switched um, stubbles from different cultivars. So we've still grown our RLM1 cultivar, but now I inoculated it with an RLM4 cultivar, and the um, plants were totally alive. And in this situation here, we've reversed it and got exactly the reverse situation. So I guess that gave us the confidence that this would be a good idea. Um, we just had to work out a way that we could actually give the industry all the information they needed to actually apply it on a commercial level. Um, we also, at this stage, I've got the Melbourne Uni people involved with Angela and Barbara, and um, they confirmed all of what we were seeing with their um, avionics gene monitoring the actual pathogen as well, which gave us a lot more confidence that what we were seeing was real. So, as I said, the first thing we had to do was work out what are the, all the major genes in our cultivars. So that took a number of years. Um, but basically, by using a differential set of isolates which can attack one resistance gene and not another resistance gene, we managed to work out the, um, what all the major genes were in our cultivars. So we worked at the time a lot with the French to get this system going and then developed our own isolates. And now we classify every cultivar into a different group depending on what its major gene complement is. So if it's a single letter, it means it gets a, it's got one major gene. Um, we have a lot of cultivars now which get up to four different groups, so that means they've got four different um, genes combined. Unfortunately, in our system, we've never put two or more undefeated genes together at once. We always have a gene that's defeated, and then we add another one to it to make it resistant. Again, that gets defeated, then we put a third one in, and I think maybe next year we'll have a first cultivar with five major genes in it. Since then, there's been two of these genes which have been cloned, um, LEPR3 and RLM2, and fortunately for us, we've got 100% correlation with our differential system, so that's been very nice. So we now routinely screen all canola cultivars in Australia. The seed companies give us their seed two years pre-release, um, and we will screen them. Um, they go into our disease nurseries, and we screen them for the major genes. So for instance, and this chart comes out to the growers every year, so they get um, a cultivar, so for instance, there's a good one, they've got an MR here, so it's a, it gets an MR black leg rating from our disease nurseries where we go canola and canola and look at the survival. We also, if the seed company wants to, they can put that entry in with a fungicide. Um, and with these, we've got new fungicides coming in the next couple of years, so there'll actually be a few extra rows. Um, so they'll get their black leg rating with the fungicide as well. And then they'll also get a resistance group which will tell the farmer how many um, resistance genes that cultivar has got in it. And then we give some advice on what they can and can't, how they could rotate those resistance genes. So if they're growing a, a straight A, they can't grow it after an A stubble, um, they can grow it after a B stubble, they can grow it after a C stubble, etc. So that's the chart that um, we base that recommendations on. I'm glad this one worked this time. So, so that's, I guess, the genetic information that we give the growers, but we also back that up with a lot of field work. So we have a network right across the Cronholo growing regions where we sow all the cultivars side by side. We have one cultivar which represents each resistance group. And I guess one of the real successes of our work has been that everything we try to, we do in the lab and the glasshouse, we try to then repeat in the field before we take that information to the industry. And the industry people can come out and all the breeders, et cetera, and the agronomists can actually see this occurring in the, um, in the field and we can talk about the science behind it. So, as I said, we have all the cultivars side by side. We pull them out of the ground and we score them for internal infection. So just a bit of a... Uh, an example here, this is some data I collected a couple of weeks, or well, maybe a month ago now. Here's our RLM1 cultivar. The cultivar next to it is RLM4, and you can see the difference in the leaf lesion severity that's occurring compared to the RLM3. Here's a stack, RLM1, RLM4, and LEPAR1, and again, a lot fewer lesions have occurred. A couple of years ago, that was completely clean, but you can see now we're getting the first lesions, which is indicating that that resistance is very slowly or just in the, the start of being overcome. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that cultivar will look like that. It really depends on how widespread these cultivars are being grown. If they're being grown year after year after year, we'll definitely see that occurring. But if they're only a small proportion of the area, they may maintain that level of resistance for a number of years. And here's um, RLM7, which is a brand new resistance gene coming into Australia. And fortunately for us, it looks like it's standing up um, and we'll get a number of years' use out of that. The other thing we do with these resistance groups is that we um, put out warnings to growers. So we had a cultivar with um, a LEPAR1 resistance on the Air Peninsula from about 2010, and it was immune. In 2000, sorry, yeah, 
prior to 2010. In 2010, we saw the first bit of disease in it. In 2011, we saw that disease really spike. So we decided as an industry that we would put out a warning to the growers, even though the, at that particular point, the cultivars were all fine. They were all performing extremely well. So we put out that warning and we came back, then we put in our monitoring sites again, we came back the next year and our Group D cultivar, which had looked for all intents and purposes and immune the year before, had completely died. The other groups were survived. And this time, because we had the monitoring sites right across the country, we just put out the warning for that one region where it was being affected. Wherever else it was stable, we didn't put warnings out. Um, and again, those groups the year after looked um, quite healthy. So this was a real win because normally pathologists tell you the year after something's happened why it happened, but they don't actually that good for actually putting out warnings the year before. And in my career, this was the first time that standing up in front of a group of farmers, they actually all cheered because we'd actually told them the year before the disaster happened that it might happen. Um, so it was a really amazing story. We also got a lot of kudos from the seed company because when the sylvestris broke down on the Air Peninsula, we didn't know what was going on and all the cultivars that contained that resistance were scrapped right across the entire country and all the lines in their breeding programs, et cetera, were scrapped, were scrapped as well. Whereas this time, they only stopped selling those cultivars in that one region. They managed to maintain them selling them in the other regions where it hadn't broken down. So that was a pretty neat outcome as well. The other thing we do with our monitoring sites is we produce in-season warnings based on... Uh, so here's an example. In 2016, we had, um, we had an extremely wet year for us in 2016. Disease pressure became very severe. You can see here's a leaf that's been completely colonised by the disease. So by using our monitoring sites, we managed to put out regional warnings that black leaf is very severe. And it's interesting, within two weeks of doing that warning, Bayer rang us to say they'd run out of fungicide. So we managed to have a very, very large and immediate effect on the, um, on the canola industry by putting out these warnings. 2017 and 2018, we would use the sites to tell people there was very low disease pressure and they didn't have to worry about fungicides. And then in 2019, we had a year where we saw leaf lesions move into the crops very late. Um, and then we started seeing this flower infection. So we told people not to spray early. And then <coughs> later in the season, we started to see the black leg on the flowers. We said, okay, Now's the time to go out and um, yeah, use that fungicide. So that's our genetics. The next part of this talk um, is our, our cultural practices. This is um, the Lower Air Peninsula. You can see it's extremely intensive canola production, probably a little bit more similar to what you have in Canada. Um, and you can see why they might have more of a black leg issue. So this is going back a long time ago, 20 years ago when, or more, when I was doing my PhD. One of the things we were looking at was the epidemiology of the disease. You can see here, at the time we were saying you needed a four year rotation for all stubble to decompose. A farmers being farmers started growing canola, wheat canola rotations. So in my PhD I set out to show them they were wrong and they were doing the wrong thing. And what we found straight away was that the canola, wheat canola rotations had exactly the same amount of disease as the one in four year rotations. So we investigated this a bit further and started measuring spore release. So this was spores that I could count um, <laughs> per rainfall event per hectare. And the point is, though, that nearly all the spores as a percentage were being produced by one-year-old stubble. The two-year-old, three-year-old, four-year-old stubble, sure, they could release spores, but actually only very small amounts. Um, this shows how old this slide is, because back then people were raking and burning and doing all sorts of things to get rid of stubble. When we looked at the plant side of that, I, um, I grew plants in pots and placed them at different distances from canola stubble. And you can see here canola and canola is getting killed. And then as we get further and further away from one year old stubble, we got less and less disease. So from that, we recommended the farmers to leave a 500 metre isolation between this year's crop and last year's canola stubble, rather than worrying about the in-crop rotation and keeping that one in four years. And farmers then started doing block farming, etc. on the farms, sowing all the canola on one side and avoiding last year's, and then sowing on another side, etc. Anything they could do to get away from canola stubble that was one year old. Um, as I said, we're now revisiting a lot of that work because the farming system's completely changed and the whole way people manage stubble has completely changed, so we really need to put a much bigger effort into that. So fungicide use. As I said, people have really tightened rotations and as they've got better canola cultivars, we've now got the hybrids, they've got much better seeding technologies and whatever, and canola's become a lot more profitable, so people want to grow a lot more canola. And that's really driven another spike in our disease levels. However, now we've had these fungicides and so we've actually become really reliant on fungicides to increase our um, intensity. 
So the backbone of our, um, of our fungicide management plan has been seed treatments. As I said at the beginning of the talk, it's protecting that seedling, which is really crucial, and therefore the seed treatments and the, um, the, fer the fungicide on the fertiliser has been very, very important and effective for that. In more recent times, we've had foliar fungicides to apply, um, and they have also been extremely good, but it's much harder to make a decision on when or when not to apply that fungicide because they're much more expensive. So last year we did a survey of 130 agronomists, and this is just all the questions we asked about fungicide use for seed treatments, and the point here was that 94% of agronomists and farmers are always using a seed treatment or on the fertiliser. This is an example here, an experiment running this year. We've inoculated plants with um, stubble, so we've just grown these plants in pots and hung a bit of stubble above them, and you can see which one's got the um, fungicide. So this is actually a new fungicide that's coming out next year, a new SDHI. Um, we also did work on how to work out the economic benefit of applying foliar fungicides. So what we found in, we had 23 sites with a range of cultivars with maturity and with black leg resistance, and in all 23 sites, the black leg ratings, the genetics reduced the amount of stem canker. In 22 out of 23 sites, the fungicides reduced the amount of stem canker, but in only five out of 23 did we get an economic response. And that's then been a lot of the work that we've done is to help farmers determine what are the situations which I'm going to be able to get an economic response and I'm not wasting my money. Again, we asked the um, agronomists what they were doing. There's, and you can see here quite a big difference. It's only 25% of farmers are now who are always using the foliar fungicides. Most of them are only actually making those decisions based on when they're needed or not. But really interesting for me was, as I said, in 2016, we first started doing this work on this upper canopy or flower and pot infection. And already within two years, farmers were becoming very confident about spraying that. And after 2019, this is based on 2018 data, after 29, I actually think this would be up around 90% of farmers who are very happy to go and put a foliar fungicide on late to control upper canopy. So at the moment, we're now recommending putting a foliar fungicide on at 30% bloom. And don't worry too much about this. These are different sites, and this is all the black leg data we collected. But the really interesting thing here is the yield responses. In two sites, we got around 20% yield return from putting a fungicide on. Another two where we got some, there was a hail event and the pods were damaged, and therefore black leg got into the pods, we are getting a 40% return. And it's interestingly, the reason this has been adopted so, so quickly has been we haven't had a lot of data, so the farmers have gone out and tried it themselves, and they all have yield monitors on their headers now, so they can leave unsprayed strips in their paddocks. And very, within the first year, the, 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 there's a few Trump farmers who did that and said, oh, we've got an extra half a tonne by putting a late foliar fungicide on. And since then, the uptake has been incredible. So it's actually really, we, I guess, came up with initial information, and the farmers have then taken that information and really, really run with it. The 30% bloom timing was very fortunate for us. We infected plants from cotyledon right the way through to potting to actually work out the best timings and if we could control it with our, um, our fungicides. And 30% bloom came out about the best, which was very fortuitous because that's also the timing that's registered for sclerotinia and they're the same fungicide. So we had no fungicide registration at this time, but it meant the farmers could put a fungicide on to control sclerotinia and also um, control this black leg spray. So that was very fortuitous. The other thing with this 30% bloom stage is in Australia, we've done a lot of work on phenology, or CSIRO has, and they found that the, 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 um, the timing that plants are most vulnerable to stress and yield loss is actually at that early flowering as well. So it's sort of no surprise that we get these responses. And the other point, the reason we get these massive yield responses, I think, is because at an upper canopy stage, if you don't have an effective major gene, the plants are completely susceptible. So it's like spraying a susceptible crop, which is very different when we're trying to control the crown canker, where we do have good genetic resistance. So the extension information we put out each year, we have, a one, we have a fact sheet which contains all the cultural practices, the rotation practices, contains all the canola cultivars and all their resistance groups, and we update that every year. Um, so that's used by the agronomists. And as Lantha said, in more recent times, we've developed a black leg app. So in this situation, the, um, we put down everything we think which will um, change the amount of disease the farmers have got, and they fill that out themselves with the agronomists. So they put in their potential yield or their target yield at the beginning of the year, they put in their sowing rates, they put in their grain price, the cost of production, and then that works out their economic return. Um, and then we start putting in the black lead data, how much canola is in the district, we put some information in about spore maturity, distance to one-year-old stubble, distance to two-year-old stubble, there's a category for if the stubble's standing or not, 
and then we put in the cultivar and then the app already knows what its Blackley rating is and what its resistance group is and then they put in their fungicide option. So in this case, the farmers put in an MS cultivar, he's got a two tonne yield target and the app's telling them they're going to get 1.6 tonnes. So it's predicting a 20% yield loss to Blackley. The farmer then can then play around with these things and to change it. So in this instance, the farmer may say, well, I don't want to get a 20% yield loss, so I'll switch to an R-rated cultivar, and now the app's suggesting they're getting no yield loss at all. Conversely, the farmer might say, well, Benito is a farmer retained seed. I don't want to buy a new seed, so I'm just going to protect my crop with fungicides, and by filling in the fungicide options, the app is predicting they're getting a 5% yield loss. Or they might want to say, well, I don't want to spend any money on this crop at all, so I'll just protect it with cultural practices by avoiding canola, stubble, et cetera, and the app's now predicting they're getting 10% yield loss. So the thing with this is we're trying to create a one-stop shop that has all knowledge, and we don't keep putting out new fact sheets and new information. We just keep updating the app. And the farmers and agronomists go to the app each year, and it's got all the latest cultivars, all the latest. So, for instance, next year I hope we'll have all the upper canopy infection recommendations in here as well. Um, and then by next year we'll have the new chemistry I was talking about, the new seed treatment, etc. So the idea is the farmers will know that this is the one place they have to go to, and that contains all the information. And it makes it so much easier for us when we're doing extension too. We don't have to keep coming out with a new management plan or a new pamphlet or a new field day. We just keep updating this app with all the information in it. So the last part of the talk is, a couple of minutes left, is fungicide resistance. So we've become interested in fungicide resistance as we've become more reliant on it. And we also became interested in it when the foliar fungicides first came out because we thought we were maybe putting the pathogen through a bottleneck. So really up until now, we've had the DMI fungicides. We've had three fungicides which we use on the seed, on the fertiliser and as a foliar, and they're all different DMIs. But coming in as of next year, we've got these new seed treatments. We've got an SDHI and we've got a strobilurin coming in too. So we wanted to get some baseline data for these chemistries and see what was happening to our older chemistries. And the way we've done this is we grow our canola seedlings in punnets and we treat each punnet with a different fungicide. We take our canola stubble, which we've primed and it's got... Um, so the agronomist will pick up this stubble for us, send it to us. They'll tell us where it's from, what its cultivar is, how much fungicide's been used on that paddock. We, um, we suspend the stubble above the, um, you see the plants underneath inside a plastic tub. We wet the stubble, seal up, and then see how much the, the infection occurs. You can see here these are all individual paddocks that we've screened against all those different fungicides. And this is the data we tend to produce. So here's our untreated. You can see a lot of the cotyledons have been colonised and are dying. Here's our, um, here's our flutriophyll, which is the fungicide we put on the fertiliser, which has been used for about 20 years. And here's our seed, old seed treatment, which is our current industry standard. And you can see on these DMIs, we're getting disease. And on the new SDHI, which hasn't been used in Australia before, they're all coming out completely clean. So from these, we collect isolates from the infected cotyledons. We put them back onto the petri dishes and do the EC50s, et cetera, to confirm that it is a tolerance. Um, and we can generate that data for each individual paddock. So, Here's our data we've put in. We've done a lot of work and stats to try and work out what our cutoff should be for resistance. Um, here's our untreated with a box plot there, so you still see a fair bit of variability in the disease. Here's um, a, cult of, uh, a maxim, which is in uh, black leg control. Here's our three DMIs. You can see a fair bit of noise happening there. And here's all our new chemistries where we're getting very, very low levels or no infection at all. One of the things we've seen is what we. As I said, all the new fungicides, we've got no resistance at all, which is fantastic. With our old fungicides, we're seeing quite high levels of, um, or high proportion of paddocks, which we think have got either high or moderate levels of um, resistance or tolerance. Interestingly, with those isolates, they're all very diverse as well. Some of those isolates, when we collect the isolates and reinfect plants, can infect all the three DMIs, and some are specific to others. Um, Melbourne Uni is now doing work on molecular markers and actually finding quite a few different mutation events is not just all one um, gene, unfortunately. So, but we really hope that we'll have some markers. One of the limitations of this work is all we know is that it's occurring. We don't know what frequency it's occurring. So it could be 1% of isolates which have got tolerance or it could be 80%, we don't know. But um, once we get the molecular markers, we um, hope that we'll be able to work that out. And we have a technique where we can release the ASCO spores from the stubble, so we can release millions of spores and then run the markers over them and then look at the frequency of isolates which it can attack or not attack. Um, and that is where I'll leave it for 46 minutes. Thank you very much.
take five minutes for questions. Plant science grad students, you have to ask a question to get a degree in this course. <laughs> but uh, questions. How does the manager of folks are going to ask questions? Go ahead. So between 2003, uh, you had a severe damage, but you also showed a feature on the QR resistance. They are not. And after another year, the uh, resistant energy recover the QRG in the Have you compare uh, isolate among different years? Yeah, yes. Yep, we have an isolate collection of about 6,000 isolates now, so we collect isolates on different resistance groups every single year, and you can run your avalanche um, markers across them and look at the, how the frequency has changed. So I haven't really touched on that. A lot of that work was done by Angela, so she's done some really extensive um, experiments looking at how the frequencies change under different rotations. Um, and it's not... We present it very simply to the farmers. So yes, yeah, it's a gene for gene interaction, you just swap genes and that's all you need to do. We now know there's all sorts of interactions happening there and it's not so simple. So hopefully as of next year, we're actually going to change the information that we give to farmers. So we'll give them a lot more information about on each individual cultivar based on that knowledge. So it might be that cultivar X, you should rotate it with genes, you know, A, B, but not C and D, et cetera. There'll be a lot more information we put out there. Yeah, so yeah, a lot of work's been done in that area. And it's nowhere near as simple as we hope it would be. Other questions? Uh, do all uh, green companies in Australia already all the work this yes. program? And they're all labeling all of their cultivars of beer? Yep. So they actually don't get a choice <laughs> in Australia. So we, we, as the independent researchers funded by the growers, we screen all cultivars. And it's voluntary. They don't have to give us their lines. But we... So we screen it for our black leg nurseries and for our resistance groups, and hopefully going forward we'll give it a lot more information about quantitative resistance as well. So the seed companies don't have to provide a seed, but every single seed company does, and they give it to us two years pre-release. The reality is in Australia, because black leg's been such a big issue, um, if they didn't give that information to the public screening, it would be hard for them to sell the seed. Also in Australia, it's really the farmers are getting the information from the agronomists, and the agronomists are getting the information from us. They're not so directly related with the seed companies. So if they go to the agronomist and the agronomist hasn't got that independent data, it's going to be hard for the seed company to have a, uh, have a hold. So yes, we have 100% knowledge on all the cultivars. And in fact, now most of the seed companies are giving us their parental lines as well to screen really quite early in their breeding program. So they know what it will be at release time. Mm -hmm. Speaking about the crown tanker and uh, the effectiveness of quantitative resistance, do you think that it has to do with the uh, tissue specific gene expression or is it to do with spore load at the point of flower? Yeah, so this is, you're talking about the crown canker for quantitative yeah. resistance? Yeah, you yeah. said that that's really where the quantitative resistance is effective. Work. Yeah, so we only see it being expressed at the crown. Uh, the rest of the plant is completely unprotected. But it, it is, we still think it is isolate specific, which is why we see the erosion of resistance. And in fact, when we have infected plants with different um, isolates, we can actually see a range of um, reactions at the crown, not just at the cotyledon as well. So it's something that's poorly understood. And we're at the moment trying to do some methodology experiments to try and develop some high throughput screening methods. But we're not having a great deal of success, unfortunately. It's very easy to screen in the field, but you just don't know what you're looking at, unfortunately. All you do see is, yeah, it's resistant or not resistant or moderate resistant. So uh, we've had trouble getting some recent sales into China because of our concerns of our isolates. Yeah. Uh, you have the same ones, and you have trouble getting them into China. Yes. So we were banned from... Is this the question Can you hear back the questions about getting our... Uh, about imports into China with blackleg? So, yeah, Australia was suspended from China for a while as well. Um, and we had a number of meetings with the Chinese and just the same as in Canada. Um, they wanted us to reduce their risk. So we um, did yeah, a reasonable amount of research to try to um, reduce the risk for their, their seed production. Yeah, but now we export um, canola back into China under a research licence. But it's a research licence that has enabled us to export X million tonnes. But we have to be shown to be reducing their risk. In the development of the app, who's all involved in it? Is it geologists and mathematicians? Yes. So 
the um, project, the developed app, actually went to the mathematicians and the app developers, and then they brought us in to give them all the knowledge about all the things and how they all interact. Um, so, so we developed a very simple app at that stage, and then we actually went out to the agronomists, and the agronomists then really designed the um, user face for it. So, for instance, I had this grand plan that you would be able to just type in your postcode, and then the app would know your region and your disease severity and your potential yield and whatever. And very quickly, the agronomist said, no, don't do that. We know our paddocks. We know what our target yield is. We know what our expense is. We don't want you to tell us that, which was actually a godsend because it made the app so much easier to develop. But they wanted the control of the inputs. So yeah, the agronomist had a big input. Yeah, that's a supplementary question. Yeah. Um, what is the uptake or the confidence that growers and their yes. agronomists have? Do yep. they hold you to that 20%? Yeah, that's an interesting one, isn't it? Um, <laughs> so we're actually doing a lot of verification on the app at the moment. Once you've got the app built, um, you can do that. And once you've got the fungicide, you can get complete control, so you actually can actually start measuring yield loss. Um, but look, the, the uptake, one of the things we do is, we because the, the agronomists will look at the blackleg ratings every year. So uh, that's another difference in Australia, is that we let the blackleg ratings of a cultivar fall every year, as, as required. So in Australia, in Canada, once you get registered an R, you're an R for life, even if the pathogen overcomes you. In Australia, every cultivar gets screened every year, and we will let the blackleg rating fall. So therefore, we tell the agronomists, last year's blackleg rating means nothing. You have to get this year's blackleg rating, you have to get it every year. The only place you can get it is in the app or the management guide. So you have to go to those um, technologies to actually get your blackleg rating. Um, but in saying that, no, we get fantastic feedback from the agronomists. They don't say they don't use it every year, but they'll, they'll go through it each year, look at it and see what things are happening, and then once they're comfortable with it, they'll talk to their clients, etc. So yeah, it's had an excellent uptake. And like I said, from my perspective, it's fantastic because we can just keep feeding new knowledge into the same system, and it's just always there. It's always updating on their phones. Mark, thank you very much. There was a token from the faculty and the department. Great seminar. I don't know why. Thank you very much.